the last time to speak to you from this pulpit, humble as it is. I thought, what is something on this last Sunday that could be helpful and beneficial going forward? And so we find ourselves in 2 Timothy chapter 3, really verse 15, 16, and 17. And folks, the children, hearing the children, I think is very appropriate for today. Because look at verse 15. How that from childhood, as Paul talks to Timothy, he speaks to him as he's writing here, he's speaking, he says, how from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation comes by the way of God, amen, from the gospel that's contained here in the word of God. It's this word. It's this word that the children hear. And sometimes you may not think they hear, but they hear. I, can, I, I never forget when, when Liam uh, won, I think back to Liam um, um, Rochelle here, when, when he was just tiny, and we saw some pictures this past week I shared with, with Ricky and her family, uh, just seeing that he was shorter than me at one time, and now he's like eight feet tall, and y'all are thinking, well, that's no big deal. All the kids are going to be taller than you in a couple of weeks probably, but that's okay. Uh, but I was looking back at those pictures and thinking about one of our services together, and I asked a rhetorical question, and of course, it being a rhetorical question, I really wasn't expecting anyone to answer, and no adult was going to answer for fear of being wrong probably, right? But Liam just speaks up and says exactly the perfect answer. And all the adults and I, you know, we all turn around like, wow, it's something that had been spoken in another sermon in passing a few weeks prior to that, but he heard it. It sunk into his brain, into his spirit, and he heard a trigger. It reminded him of it, and he just verbatim repeated what he had heard. I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget that day. But I hear it often from the children because they're being taught at home God's Word. Some of you are going through doing a catechism with your children. And listen, a catechism is not a bad thing. It's not a Roman Catholic thing per se, although they've coined the phrase a catechism for their young people. But that is a, a, a word that simply means instruction or teaching. And some of you are going through very intentionally with your little ones, asking them questions. Who created all things? And you're giving them the answer from Scripture. And they're learning and they're memorizing. And praise God for that, parents. Amen. And that's what we see here. And Paul is commending Timothy and, and his mom. You, you've learned these things. And he's already bragged on his mom there a little bit earlier in this portion of Scripture. But look at these last two verses. And this is where I really want us to focus on for the re remainder of our time together this morning. Verses 16 and 17 where we read this. Paul writing to Timothy, he says that all Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so I thought the last Sunday of the year, this would be very appropriate for us to learn to hold the Word of God in its rightful place and for us to learn how useful, how necessary and vitally important it actually is for every one of us and that we will see a, a hopefully, I, my, my prayer is that you and I all would find a, a rekindling within us for God's Word. Every one of us. And some of you may be thinking, well, I'm, I'm in God's Word every day. I pray you'll be in it more intentionally every day going forward. I pray that we will not just read it just to read it, but we will read it. I pray that we will read it to study. I pray that we will study to do the things that God calls us to do herein. And let's talk about a few of those. And so the, the main idea today is that all Scripture is sufficient for all the spiritual needs of all of the people of God. We need to go to church. We're called to be a body together. And preaching of the Word is the means by which God has, has appointed for the building up of the body together. And we read that, and we've studied it this last couple of months in Ephesians as we looked back at chapter 2 and chapter 4 and talking about how God calls pastors and teachers, right, to, to build up the church so that the saints, the body of Christ, will do the working of ministry. We've talked about those things. The preaching, the proclamation of the Word is vitally necessary for church life. No Christian was 
intended to be an island among themselves and say, I've got Jesus in the Bible. That's all I need. That was never God's plan. He called us to be a body together, and we absolutely need the togetherness. But it's more than just coming together and hearing the Word of God preached It's more than just maybe taking notes and then sticking them in the back of our Bible and never opening them up again, never looking or reviewing them until they start to fall out of our Bible because we've got so many back there. And then we drop them all on the floor like I did last week, and you start going through some of those things and going, oh, yeah, that's not the goal. The goal is that we come here and we study and we learn together. We grow together as a body, and we grow at home and at work on our break. Right? They don't pay you to study the Bible on the clock. They're paying you to do a job, but on your break, in the car when you're in, a, in construction and you're parked and you have your phone with your Bible on it, that may be an appropriate time. Never when you're driving. Amen? Pay attention to what's going on. When you're walking the dog or the dogs, right? When you're at the park and the kids are playing and you've got a few moments looking at Scripture, always saturating, saturating our mind, but it's sufficient for every spiritual need of God's people. It's sufficient. And the word sufficient doesn't just mean that it's, it's, you know, it's okay and, and it's adequate. And, and even though that word adequate is used here, notice there in verse 17, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The word adequate, we understand that oftentimes in modern vernacular here that it just means like like it's acceptable like it's okay it's adequate it'll do we'll make do with God's word because that's all he's given us and some people think it's adequate but a new revelation from God is is what I really need and what God wants us to have and there's new words from the Lord and that's that's nonsensical this word is artios the word adequate it means thoroughly equipped God's Word is sufficient to thoroughly equip a believer. It's everything we need for life and godliness, Paul says elsewhere. It's this Word. We're not looking for a new Word. If there's a new Word and it's different than what's in Scripture, to quote, it was Steve Lawson originally, I almost said Justin Peters, but to quote Justin Peters who quoted Steve Lawson, if there is a new revelation from God and it's something brand new that's not in Scripture, What? It's not true. If it's a new word from God and it's exactly what we find in Scripture, it's it's not necessary. We have it already. God's word is sufficient for us. We're always looking for more. We're always looking for another feeling, another emotion, a new high, some experience. But God has given us his word. And we... We let it sit by our nightstand and collect dust oftentimes. We look at the verse of the day because it comes up in our Bible app, and we give it a glance and we sit it down. Or maybe we share it to social media because we look really spiritual when we do that. But it never saturates our mind and our heart. We never meditate upon it. And meditation, biblically speaking, is not emptying ourselves and crossing our legs and positioning ourselves and saying, Om. That's Hinduism, that's a false religion, that's ungodly, that leads to some very dangerous things. Biblical meditation is saturating your mind with God's Word. And so we read things like, all Scripture is inspired by God. What does inspired mean? Breathed out. All Scripture. What is the Scripture? 66 books of the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. It starts with Genesis. It ends with Revelation. All the Scripture is inspired. When was the Scripture given? Oh, about 1,600 years, uh, over a 1,600-year time period, right? And, 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 and Moses wrote the, the beginnings, books there. And Oh, wait, but the book of Jude. I'm thinking about how Job was actually written before the Pentateuch and and I start thinking about God's word and how it was everything that was needed at the time it was given and it's everything that's necessary now all scripture is inspired what does that word mean breathed out by God it's the breath of God through the human instrument onto the page for all people for all time 
It's his word that will stand, that'll never be thwarted, that'll never be undermined, that'll never be destroyed. And ruler after ruler have sought to do just that. Libraries have been burned. Scrolls and, uh, of the Old Testament were destroyed by fire after fire. They were hidden, they were buried, they were ripped and torn uh, asunder. But, 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 but leader and dictator after leader and after dictator, they have tried, but they will never succeed never succeed. God's Word stands forever. It's what we need, and it's everything we need. It's profitable to us. It's more profitable than your 401k. It's more profitable than your Bitcoin. It's more profitable than anything this world has to offer. This Word is profitable for us, and so it is sufficient perfectly suited for our every need. And just to remind you, we don't worship the Scripture above the God of the Scripture, amen? But we hold it right up there closely. In fact, you'll remember from our studies in the Psalms that God says that He has held His Word above His name. This is the Word of God. And so we, would, we, we, we should warrant that thinking Christian, God's word is vitally important. If God exalts his word above his very name, then we had better pay attention. Amen? And so, let's look at just a few things here about God's word. All scripture is sufficient. We see in the beginning of verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable. First of all, note that it is God's word. And I know that's like one of those duh kind of statements because we've said that a number of times over and over. But oftentimes we relegate it to be just some words that men put down on the page because they were inspired the way Mozart was inspired to, to, to write music. The way Lady Gaga was... No, we're not going to throw Lady Gaga in there. I'm just kidding. I don't know what you would call that. But we were inspired like an artist to paint a canvas. We were inspired like, you know, something else. That's not what it means. It's breathed out by God. It's the very words of God, but he used human instruments to pen exactly what he wanted them to do. Men were carried along by the Spirit of God to write. It's God's writing. It's God's Word. And so the Word of God is God's Word. Someone once said, I read this quote last week, God's Word works in this world because it has its source from outside this world. The problems that we have here are problems that have been caused by the sin of humanity. All of us find ourselves born into sin, seeped in sin at birth. Amen? And so we can't find the hope and the answers within ourselves and worldly psychiatry and psychology seeks to do just that. You have to look inward, and you need a better self-esteem. If you would think more of yourself, which has never been anyone's problem, never. Our problem is we think too much of ourselves, and we do it positively or negatively. And I've said this all year long. I repeat this over and over again because it's true. You think too much of yourself by thinking you're more than you are. You think too much of yourself wrongly also by thinking you're less than what you are. You think you're haughty, you think you're all that in a bag of potato chips, or you think you're worthless and you're just, you know, like the dirt on the bottom of a good man's shoe. But the reality is that you were created in the image of God. And without Jesus, you're lost in your sin. That's true. All of us were born into sin, seeped in sin at birth, right? There's none righteous, not one, Romans 3.10. But God so loved the world, amen? God, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God gave His Son, Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that we're so valuable. It's, it's more than that. It's God's glory that's at stake here. It's His Word. It's His promise that He would redeem a people for Himself. But with that, He sought to save you, and He sought to save me. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. The Father sent His Son as a sacrifice for us, lost in sin though we were. Jesus did that for us. Jesus laid down his life for us. This word is God's word, and it is from outside of this world, and that's why it works. That's why it lasts. That's why it can't be stopped by Hitler or Biden or whoever. That's why no one will be able to stop it. It's God's word. And it works because God 
And I've used this illustration before in the past. We think about time oftentimes wrongly as cyclical. Um, and a lot of religions teach that the world, that time is, 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 is just a cycle and we, we just keep repeating over and over again. And the, 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 the wrong ideals of reincarnation and things like that stem from that Eastern mystical kind of mindset. But the, 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 the time of, that we find ourselves in, excuse me, time is not cyclical at all. Yes, we repeat the same mistakes over and over again because we're stubborn and hard-headed. Okay? But time is moving somewhere. And God, I like to imagine this as a parade. I don't know that we've had a parade lately because of the way the world is in the madness of, of, of uh, COVID and, and whatnot here. But, but I can remember back to the times when I was a kid and, and saw the parade in downtown Orange. And we would go and we would, we would always sit up at what used to be called East Campus, the old Stark High School on Green Avenue. And we would watch and I would see the beginning of the parade coming. And I would see everything that happened as it passed by me. And then I would see the end. And I was wanting always to stay for all of the parade because throughout the parade, from beginning to end, guess what they were doing, kids? They were throwing out love. I mean, candy. It was just great as they threw out candy after candy after candy. And so you would stay and you would see the whole thing progress by. And there was Christmas parades and there was like West Orange used to win state champs all of the time. And, and there was always school parades, that sort of thing. But, but it was always the same. You would find a vantage point, and you would watch as it passed you by, beginning, middle, and end. And we oftentimes think of everything from that perspective. But God inhabits eternity. God is outside of time. He already knows the beginning from the end and everything that happens in between. And that's why he was able to use humans, fallen as they were, to pen the very words that he breathed out. And they would be applicable for all time because he is from outside of time. He knew when man would fall before he created man. You remember Ephesians 1 and 1 Peter chapter 1 both tell us that before the foundation of the world, God had set his plan of redemption in motion. Before there was a world, before there was the first human to fall into sin, God had already appointed that the Son would give his life for us. God's word is sufficient. We find the story of our fallenness. We find the story of our redemption. We find the story of hope here in God's word. Amen. We just celebrated that a little bit this past week. Just this weekend with Christmas time, we gather together and just very simply we sing songs and we, we read scripture and we just talk a little bit about what Christ has done for us. We do that Sunday after Sunday and Wednesday after Wednesday and Friday after Friday and any other day we gather together and open up God's word. Amen. It's sufficient. It's God's word. Secondly, the word of God is sufficient. It's a sufficient word. So he says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. This word is everything we need for life and godliness, Paul says elsewhere. So a couple of things here we see about this sufficient word. The first we see right there where it's useful for teaching. It will teach us because we're ignorant. And this is not a very positive statement, I realize, but it's true. And I'm the king of the ignorant ones. <laughs> I just want you to know that. I'm not just pointing my finger at you. I take this label myself. God gives us his word to teach us because we are ignorant. Sheep are, 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 is a, sheep are animals that the scriptures use over and over again to identify God's people and God as shepherd. I think that's a very appropriate animal that's picked because sheep are cute and they're fluffy, but they're pretty ignorant. They are. They have to be led. They will walk right off of a cliff. They'll walk right out into the middle of, 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 of running water, and, and their, their wool, their, their, their wool, yeah, I was fixing to say fur, their wool will weight them down. They're not the brightest creature. And it's not that God is being mean to us. And, and a lost person would say, Heather, your God is such a meanie. He calls us dumb sheep. But he's a loving shepherd. And he teaches us. And he, he leads us. He tells us which way to go. Because we need to know. All we are like sheep. We've all gone astray. Each one has gone to his own way. 
That's why we must be taught from God's Word. And sadly today, you can teach anything as truth except for God's Word, which is the truth. We can talk about the Quran. We can talk about the, um, the Bagat Galvidas. I can't ever say that one very good. Some of those Eastern writings. We can talk about A Course in Miracles, which is Oprah Winfrey's favorite religious works, New Age mantras. We can talk about the church of Satan and, and do what thou will as the whole law. But as soon as you begin to talk about Scripture, God's Word, Everyone gets upset, it seems like. Anything goes but the truth in this day. But this word is absolutely vital for us. It's sufficient to teach us because we need to be taught. It will convict us because we are rebellious. We have gone astray. We're born into sin, and we are sinners. Both of those realities are true, and theologians debate which comes first, I don't think God's word has been given to us so that we can spend all of our time worrying about what comes first in that regard. But we are sinners. We're born in sin and we sin. Both of those realities are true. And we can disagree on which one comes first if we like as long as we acknowledge that both of those things are true. We are sinners and we sin. We're born into sin, and we sin. Therefore, we need conviction from God's Word. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. We need to be shown. We need to be taught. We need to be convicted. Used to, even in America, when the church shone brightly, when the church stood apart from the world, and we're talking decades ago, when the church was a city on a hill shining in the darkness, when there were men and women of conviction who refused to compromise God's Word, and women whose lives lined up with Scripture, used to, that carried on into the consciousness of this nation. And abortion was frowned upon, which is murder, by the way. And the church stood in the gap for a lost humanity. And because the church was convicted of her sin, and we all being a part of the church body, right? As individual Christians were convicted of their sin, that bled out into the country, the nation. And there was not a holiness in our nation per se, but there was an acknowledgement that there was good and there was evil. The church influenced society. Not that that's our goal, and that's not what we seek out to do, but as we walk in holiness, the society will absolutely be changed based upon that holiness. We don't seek to make Washington better as our first line of offense. We seek to be better Christians. We seek to be more godly, amen? And as more Christians are being more godly, the world notices. And we're in a day in which... We are lovers of self, irreconcilable. The light will absolutely shine brightly today. And so what convicts us? Is it a song that's played or sang by the person whose voice we really like? Sometimes that makes us emotional. But what God uses to convict the world of sin is the Word of God. And sometimes we sing the Word of God. Sometimes we pray the Word of God. We read the Word of God, we preach and proclaim the Word of God, but it's the Word of God that will convict the world of sin. But judgment begins here with the house of God. Amen? And so, Christian, allow God's Word to convict you of your sin. Because though you are saved by grace alone through faith alone, Christian, though we are saved, we are still battling a rebelliousness within us. Sin still rears up its ugly head from time to time. Amen? How many of you are perfect right now and you don't struggle with sin? Only Courtney Fowler raised her hand. Now we're all going to pray and fast for Courtney Fowler right now that she'll be convicted of her pride. No, I'm just teasing Courtney, but she was just joking. But we know we sin. If we were honest, how many of you have sinned today? 
How many of you prayed and asked God to convict you today? How many of you were convicted before you prayed and that made you pray today? That's how God works, Christian. His Spirit using His Word to convict us of sin. You know why we're convicted? Do we automatically know everything that's wrong? Well, there's a case that could be made for some, some part of that in Romans chapter 1. But Christian, we are able to identify the, the, the sin from the almost good thing because of God's Word. Amen? As we get into God's Word, we are able to see, and God uses His Word to convict us of our sin. And the Holy Spirit does that through His Word. The Word of God is sufficient because it will restore us. And I am so grateful for this. I'm grateful for all of this. I need to be taught. I need to be convicted. But I absolutely need restoration, and so do you. Because we're unable, we're incapable of restoring ourselves. We say this a lot and we use the scripture from Ephesians chapter 2 to make this point, because that is the point that Paul is making therein. Dead people can't fix themselves. Dead people can't make themselves alive. It takes a force outside of us to make us alive, and it's God. Amen? And God uses his word and his spirit to restore us. So I'm so grateful for David. David is one of those great heroes of the faith we talked about uh, him these last couple of weeks as we went through the genealogy of Jesus. And this past Wednesday as we looked at some of the women, even talking about Bathsheba and how David sinned with her. Uh, we looked at those four women in particular. Um, it, powerful, I think, study just looking at the, the hopelessness of humanity but seeing the hope we have from God. Oh, thank God for that. But I like David. I look to David for hope because... David's grotesque sin reminds me that there's hope for me. It doesn't excuse my sin. I'm not saying that, Laura. What I'm saying is it gives me hope because if David can be forgiven, if David was called a man after God's own heart, being the sinner that he was, there's hope for you and I. Amen? There's hope for you and I. I'm so grateful for Psalm 51 that David penned after the confrontation from the prophet when he was confronted with his sin and how, how this, this prayer of pardon from a sinner's contrite heart, a heart of conviction. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgression. You know what a transgression is? Sin. Blot out my sin, God. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me. Against you and you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. God is not a cosmic meanie. He is just and kind. He's angry at sin, <laughs> He hates sin and he loves humanity enough to send his son Jesus Christ. But he is just. He has to deal with sin. But verse 4 reminds us he's blameless when he does judge because he is a righteous judge. Look at David. Look what he says. I was brought forth in iniquity. I was conceived and born in sin. Before he is able to make a conscious choice to sin or not to sin, he acknowledges that he's brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make known to me wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. He refers back to, to something from the plant that was used in temple sacrifices as a symbol of his contrite heart. He wants to be washed and cleansed by God. He says, if you do this, if you wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness and let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And I love this next part. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And he goes on from there 
to speak about the hope that comes from that restoration. But folks, make no mistake, the restoration comes from God. It's God that gives us the new heart, amen? As we prayed earlier, he takes a heart of stone from a sinner and he gives a heart of flesh. And then when we sin, he brings us to repentance and forgives us of our sin and creates in us a clean heart. We need that because we're incapable to do it ourselves. And I know I've said it in the past, but it would be like a human surgeon. And let's even make this illustration just that much more dire. And, 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 and it, it would be like an orthopedic surgeon. What does an orthopedic surgeon do? Huh? Works on what? All right. And let's get real specific. Let's say it's the kind of surgeon that only works on feet. And he's got blockage in his heart. And so what does the orthopedic foot specialist do? He says, I am going to create in myself a clean heart. I will do my own open heart surgery. And we kind of smile. And those of you who are in the medical profession laugh. You realize how ludicrous that sounds. But that is exactly what we seek to do when we try to make ourselves whole apart from God. It's God who does the changing. It's God who does the teaching, the convicting, and the restoration because we are ignorant, rebellious, and incapable of fixing ourselves. And finally, God's Word is sufficient because it will train us in righteousness. It does all of these things, and it trains us, right? It trains us. Verse, verse 16, it, 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 it's training us in righteous ways because we need oversight. We're like sheep who wander off. We're like sheep who, who don't even know where, where the next patch of grass is for our feeding. We're like sheep who would wrongly go into the rushing water instead of being led to the still, quiet waters. We're ignorant, rebellious, and capable, and we need training. We need oversight. And listen, lest we make the foolish mistake of so many in the Word of Faith movement, I'll never forget when I first heard Joyce Meyer say that she no longer sins. I thought I would vomit out of my mouth because that is the ultimate of haughtiness and self-centeredness. Amen? If you ever find yourself moving to a place where you think you have arrived in perfection and you're still in this body, you better repent. Amen? You better repent. You better get on your knees. And you better find some hyssop. You better call out to God because you're in a very precarious place. We never arrive this side of glory. We never arrive. I have not arrived. And folks, listen. You know I tell stories sometimes, not too often because I usually ruin them. I try not to joke too much because uh, sometimes they just come out. But if I try to prepare a joke, you know I can't do it. I'll start laughing beforehand. I'll tell the, the punchline out of order. I just, I just am not good at that. But those things don't really help us anyway. We try to stick to this. But sometimes, I, I, and very seldomly, I may share a victory that's happened. But I hope that you hear when I share a victory, who gets the credit usually when I share a victory? God. It's because he's done something and orchestrating it. But I often share my great failures. And it's not because I celebrate my sin. It's because I know that I need a redeemer. And not just in July of 1988 when he first saved me after graduating high school. It wasn't just then when I was really a bad sinner. Right, Lauren? <laughs> I need that Jesus still today. I still need that today. And so I talk about failures so that you know that I have not arrived. I share struggles with you because I'm human. Not to glory in sin. Please don't ever hear that. It's not to glory in sin. It's to point to our Redeemer. Folks, I have not arrived. I need this word just as much as you. In fact, I think I need it more than you because of the position that God has called me to. I'm going to be judged more harshly than you are because I'm a pastor. And so I think I really need this word. And woe be unto me if I neglect this word. Amen? But folks, we need it. We need it. This word is everything we need. It's sufficient for everything. Teaching, 
when we're wrong because we're ignorant, convicting us when we're rebelling, actively being wrong, restoring us when we've sinned and fallen because we can't pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, and training us because we need direction. I need direction. You need direction. We need it together. Amen? That's why this is not about our best life now. It's not about our vision statement for 2022. It's about God's Word. You know what our mission is? It's the same thing. You know what our focus is this, year? is this year? It's the same focus we should have every single day as believers. Making disciples for Christ. That's it. And where do we find that? In God's Word. In God's Word. John MacArthur said in, in his message, Our Sufficiency in Christ, he said, There is no substitute for submission to Scripture. Your spiritual health depends on placing the utmost value on the Word of God and obeying it with an eager heart. <laughs> you, if you think you can find answers to your spiritual problems through human counsel or worldly wisdom, you are forfeiting the most valuable and only reliable source of answers to the human dilemma. Don't relinquish the sweet, satisfying riches of God's Word for the bitter gall of this world's folly. And folks, that's a, that's a very beautiful, very poetic, very wordy way. He has a good way with words. Phil Johnson is his uh, editor. Phil Johnson's very good in, in, in helping piece a lot of the sermons that get turned into books for MacArthur. They work very well together. They've been together for years. But folks, don't get lost in the beautiful wordsmithing. Do you see what he's saying? God's word is here. Human wisdom is, is just off the radar. It's so far beneath God's Word. And if you're like me, oftentimes you run to the quick fix, the easy fix, what's right before us. Anybody else guilty of that oftentimes? But God's Word is all that we need, amen? And so look at this last thing. The Word of God is God's Word. The Word of God is sufficient for teaching, convicting, restoring, training. Finally, the Word of God is God's Word to equip believers. And this is the point. This is the point. Verse 17, so that the man of God, man is generic again here, okay? So that the human of God, the person of God may be artios, thoroughly equipped or adequate, as it says here, equipped for every good work. It means you are thoroughly prepared for everything that life brings your way. God's word does that. Not God's word plus a new revelation, not God's word plus some miracle, not God's word plus any emotion. It's God's word that's sufficient, folks. It's God's word to equip believers for the work of ministry. But here's the, here's the problem in so many churches in America today. And I'm very grateful that this is not a huge problem here. But let's nip it, okay? Let's nip it before it becomes one. If you are only in God's Word when I open up God's Word on Sunday morning, and you may or may not open it with me, or you may just watch it on these screens, which are, are helpful, but please don't depend on them, okay? Please don't depend on them. Get in the habit of finding God's Word, finding those books as we turn there. But if you're only opening up on Sunday morning at 1030, between 1030 and noon, you will be anemic. You'll be anemic. You'll be weak. You'll be pale. You will not have endurance. When stress comes, when trials come, you'll faint under the pressure. You need to be in God's Word every single day. And so, if God so chooses that this is the last time that we're together, I'm not planning on going anywhere. Please, last week I mentioned something along these lines, and someone, someone came up and said, hey, you're not planning on, it was about like planning churches. Someone said, you're not planning on like moving and starting another church, are you? I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. I've been called here, but I would love to see us plant churches. And we don't, none of us know what God's going to do with any of us in the days ahead. Amen? That's any of us. But we are going to be a church, planting church. As long as the Lord tarries, if there's time, we're going to do what we can to continue to spread God's word. And never be so big that we can't know each other will intentionally multiply and divide so that people can be cared for. Folks, listen, I, I can't care for everybody by myself even and do the pastoring, the, the preaching, the preparation. That's my primary calling. I think we know that and understand that. Minister of the gospel, 
is supposed to bring the Word of God. So that, that involves feeding, right? Correcting all those things, but, but feeding and, and shepherding is, is, is feeding, and it's also protecting the flock. All, all of that stuff is in, included. But it makes it hard to do all of the other things. And, and, and let me just acknowledge my humanness. For the last seven years, um, I've been filling in leading music up here. Now, some of you think, what do you mean filling in? You're the only one that we've ever seen do, do music. That was never the plan. That was never the plan. It may not look tiring, but it's very exhausting, at least for me with my frailty, to do that and to preach and to have energy to preach. Some of you are thinking, you're not doing anything physical. I mean, all you're doing is standing there and talking, and you talk all the time. Your jaw ought to be really strong by now. I mean, you're going on, you know, what, 40-something minutes already, Pastor. But, folks, it's It's tiring. And so we've been praying for about two years now, since before COVID. And I'm very happy to say and relieved to say that next Sunday on January 2nd, uh, Brandon Bose, who is really like a son to us, to Becky and I, we love him so much, although he has good godly parents. Hello, Mr. and Ms. Bose out there in the camera. We're very happy to say that he is going to be coming on here. He's going to be joining the church. And he's going to be helping to give direction to the music portion of our worship time uh, as um, a music minister. And he's going to be working with children as well, giving some oversight to our children's ministry. Folks, I know that may seem sudden to you, but that's been two years in the process. And we've been talking about it a little bit, little bit by little bit. The elders have been praying and discussing. And it all kind of came together in the last month to where it was time. And so, folks, let me just say, hallelujah, I'm relieved, I'm relieved. But even with Brandon now doing that, folks, that's still not enough. That's still not enough. Brandon coming on to help do that part, and the musicians still necessary. The, the, the singers still necessary. The children's workers still necessary. That's still not enough. PJ still leading our youth. You know what? That's not enough. That's not enough. Our elders elding. That's a new word I just made up. <laughs> Please don't go repeat that in public, okay? That's, that's, that's not a real word. But that's not enough. That's not enough. The people handing out bulletins at the door, absolutely vitally necessary. But you know what? That's not enough. Even if they smile and they do welcome, I mean, just real big like that, that's still, as great as that is, that's not enough. It takes all of us being equipped. Amen? It takes all of us being equipped. And God's Word is what does that. And so he calls pastors and teachers for training. We read that again two or three weeks ago in Ephesians to prepare the people for the works of service. And folks, that's what we're positioning ourselves now to do. And I'm praying as God continues to bless. And I know we're, we're scattered today. It's still a holiday weekend, and there's still some families who are even sick right now. We've got several families you need to check on and, and just be mindful of. If they're not here, reach out, okay? We're not going to tell who's sick across the airwaves here, but, but just make note of who's missing and reach out to them. But it takes all of us together. And as God is building this body and putting people in places uh, here, not just sitting, but as, as more people are coming and as more people are getting involved, He is doing a work in this place. Place. He's doing a work in us, but He's also doing a work through us. Amen? And I, for one, am excited about what God's doing. Are you? Are you excited? Yes. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> Thank you. Heather's excited enough for all of us. I'm excited, but it's God's Word that equips us. And so, what is our vision for this coming year? It's this. Same thing we've been doing. Let's just do it better. Amen? Let's find ourselves approved as workmen who rightly handle the Word of God. Amen? That's all of us. And so, stay in God's Word. Bill Hull, um, I don't know a whole lot about Bill Hull. I've read a few of his books on disciple making. Um, And let me just end this. I think this may be on your your handout there. But in the Disciple Making Pastor... It's a book I reread last month. He says this. He says, Today's ineffective church product results from Christians not rightly relating to God's Word. Now, let me repeat that because this is rich. Ineffective church product 
Does that sting a little bit? Have we not in America made church a product? Very business oriented. We have business structures and committees and, and you know, meetings and agendas. And I mean, just all of these things that have nothing really to do with church. But today's ineffective church product results from Christians not rightly relating to God's word. Yes, many evangelicals will attend church and listen to a sermon, but it ends there. They must be spoon fed. Disciples are self feeding, they know how to take food and put it where it belongs. Little consternation seems to exist over the fact that the majority of Christians cannot feed themselves. And in context, fairly, he's talking about a whole, as a whole, the church in the United States of America. We are anemic as a whole. But praise God that there are so many of us here, and it's contagious, it seems like. So many are, are just stirred by God's Word on Sunday or on Friday or on Wednesday, and they're going home, and they're being rekindled in the, in the Word of God on their own as they study, or as families study together, and, and, and couples study together, and they're going out and sharing that, and it's contagious, and people are noticing. I notice. I mean, it does my heart good. It's as if I'm working myself out of a job. And that's the goal, that you would be thoroughly equipped. Amen? That you wouldn't have to call me every time the waters get rough. Not that you can't. Please don't hear that. And not that I'm planning on going anywhere. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that you are in God's 